All right. Hello. I'm uh, Scott Jones. I'm uh, acting director of Electronic Frontiers Georgia. And, uh, you know, tonight we are, are very honored to have with us uh, Representative Becky Evans uh, for Georgia House District 83. Um, this is uh, state government, by the way, just to be clear on that. Um, the, so the state of Georgia is a bicameral system. We have both a House and a Senate. And not every state has that, but but we do. I think most of them do. Um, so I want to go ahead and uh, get started uh, with Becky. Becky, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your district and how you got interested in public service. Great. Good. Well, thank you so much, Scott. And hello to Electronic Frontiers. I'm so glad to be with you tonight. My name is Representative Becky Evans, and I've been serving in the Georgia House uh, since 2018, so I'm in my second term. And uh, House District 83 is an all-decad district, uh, 16 miles long and one mile wide. Uh, and it is a gerrymandered district. It's a, it's a, it's a stacked district. So um, but anyhow, I, have the, I am so blessed to get to represent many unique and beautiful portions of many different neighborhoods. Um, uh, running from Ellenwood, Panthersville, portions of Candler, McAfee, East Lake, Oak Perch, portions of Decatur, um, portions of Druid Hills, and up to Briar, Briar, uh, Briarcliff. Excuse me, Briar Vista. But, um, one thing that's helpful to learn about my district is to say all the special places that other people may know about, like Hallenwall Fine Arts is in our district, Fernbank Natural History Museum is in our district. Um, uh, the Olmstead Parks, most of them, not all of them, are in my district. Uh, on the south end, the Michelle Obama Trail, Nature Trail on the South River is in our district. Georgia State at Panthersville is in our district. Uh, the GBI headquarters for the state is in our district. Um, and uh, East Lake Golf Course is in our district, and Drew Charter School and the East Lake YMCA. So these are some of the places that you may know in DeKalb County that are in House District 83. Um, and as far as my background, uh, I was uh, I was born and raised in Dallas, um, and my father was a civil rights and social justice activist and had a profound influence on me. And I came to study at Emory University, and I fell in love with Atlanta, and so I stayed. Atlanta and her people, and so I stayed. Well, I went back to Texas for two years, but then I, I transferred in my job uh, back here. And I worked for a healthcare software company called HBO and Company, um, which is now McKesson. And, uh, so I was, you know, did education and project management with them. And then uh, when I was pregnant with my third child, I resigned. Um, my husband was a big traveler, a traveling salesman. And uh, so we did kind of revert back to more traditional ways there for a while where I was at home and a community organizer and the, our kids, I went to public school. I was, did all the, you know, PK president and all that kind of stuff. And I helped start a nonprofit at my kids' high school. And um, then when they all graduated, I kind of felt a yearning to do something more. And the school they went to was very diverse, Druid Hills High School. And um, so I kind of felt my world drinking a little bit uh, more then. And I, um, Senator Elena Parent had just become our, our, our neighborhood senator. And mm -hmm. So I reached out to her to see if I could help her in any way. And I ended up being an aide on local issues to her for, for three years. And as I was working for her, um, and after we had the 2016 election, um, I, well, I have several stories about all that, about how I decided. I basically, I actually, um, you know, how I decided to run, um, I have loved ones, you know, that are on both sides of the political spectrum. So I basically woke up that morning uh, when we, um, when former President Trump was elected, and I had this deep, you know, just pit in my stomach, this deep sadness. I felt like our country wasn't communicating. We weren't really communicating well with each other, and I, um, and so anyhow. But then I had friends that went to the women's 
uh, we're going to march in Washington. And I was like, you know what, I can do that. So I went with friends. I was very inspired and empowered by the Women's March. And then um, uh, I came back from that experience and, and was working with Senator Parent. And I, you know, basically kind of felt called to, 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 to run for office myself. And it was a big decision. I did, I did a challenge a fellow Democrat um, incumbent. And, um, but um, it all worked out. You know, I, I love this job. I love the opportunity to meet with people, listen to people's concerns, and uh, try to think about legislation that can help solve problems. And, uh, and so here we are. So that's a little bit about me. I have three adult children. They're all 20-something, and they didn't need me looking over their shoulder all the time. So it's good that I have have this have this job to do. So yes, and I'm, I love to hike, and I I, I cycle recreationally, and um, but I love walking neighborhoods. I love connected neighborhoods. That's something we have a lot of in central in the central and northern part of my district, and I want to help work on our commissioners and uh, and uh, and parks and rec people to have more connectivity in the southern part of our district. Okay. All right, yeah. I wanted to start off with our first question, which is to um, to find out more about the new voting law. And obviously we had a, a number of laws, but I think uh, the, there's a, there is a big 98-page uh, omnibus bill out there. Um, there certainly is. Oh my goodness. I don't goodness. know that we can cover I want to, yeah, I, I'm going to give you the highlights and then take questions. Yeah, so, sure. I'm sure this is a well-read group as well. Yeah, so I'm sure you've heard about this all. So let me just kind of talk a little bit about this legislative session before we go straight into the law. So it was a very challenging legislative session. I mean, COVID overshadowed everything at the beginning. And then this election law from the middle you know, to the end really overshadowed everything. It sucked a, a lot of energy away from other topics. So, um, and uh, there was a lot, there was kind of a mood of tension at the Capitol, uh, high tension over over this. And, um, and the other thing just I would say to kind of paint a picture for you is usually the Capitol, you know, is a hotbed of, you know, activists coming, people coming to the rope lines. And, and it's a place where there's just a lot of physical interaction and connection. And under COVID, of course, we couldn't do that. And so um, we really missed uh, the people in the hallways. But of course, it was the right thing to do. But also the legislators were more separated. We were um, usually there are 180 of us there on the House floor together. But uh, both this summer and in this session, we were spread out in three areas. The ones with more seniority, they're on the House floor. And then I was up in the gallery and balcony. And then there's a room 341. Um, and uh, and uh, this summer, we all had to vote by roll call. But for this session, we were able to vote electronically. So we had little special lap, lap pads to you know, vote on. Um, but also, what, was to, what, what I feel like I noticed more was, um, well, basically, like when you're, when you're first together, I mean, when we were first elected, I was surprised about how much interaction there was like a, between parties and we're not seated by party. So you have seat mates of one party and the other party you know, on either side of you. You get to know people more on a, you know, just a people to people basis. Mm -hmm. But this session, since we were more separated, um, uh, I felt like, and also maybe over this election, and of course after the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th, there was just more division and tension and less, um, you know, talking with, mm -hmm. with, chatting with one another. So anyway, this all contributed to this heightened tension over this election law. So, um, and uh, there were, you know, the, you know, and basically I will say is, I mean, you know, the, our, the, the Democratic Party was able to take the presidency and to get the two U.S. Senate seats. So that was so exciting for us, you know, but for the majority party in the House and the Senate, they felt like they had to, you know, pass this election bill. They had no choice. So that is, and, and, you know, we feel like many of these measures would not have passed if they had won those elections. You know, they would not have put all these measures in place. So, um, uh, but basically, 
Uh, I'm going to divide this up. I really like how the ACLU talked about Senate Bill 202. Um, and so, I'm sorry, and I want to go back one more thing. So there was another bill earlier in the session that had um, a lot of election reform, a lot of election changes, and White House Bill 535. And then on the Senate, they had another omnibus bill. And um, so, like, the House passed the 535, and that was on a purely partisan vote. It's the only caucus position that for the House Democratic Caucus to, was to be against that bill. That went to the Senate. The Senate bill came to the House. And then the head, you know, the head of this special committee on election integrity, he put together this new bill, uh, Senate Bill 202. And I, I think you all might know as far as how crazy it can be that, like, basically it was a two-page bill that he stripped and he put, you know, added another 96 pages to it. And he basically took portions of all these different laws they, they talked about. But it did remove Senate Bill 202. That does not have the most draconian measures. And I want to thank any of you that are activists because activists really helped. Had a lot of people come testify. So um, it does not uh, it does not include opt out registration because you know in Georgia when you go to get your driver's license, you're automatically opted in to be registered to vote, um, and that's a good thing. That's helped to get really increase our voter registration numbers by quite a bit. Um, uh, it did not eliminate no excuse absentee voting. And um, in some areas of the state, it does increase mandated in-person voting. Okay, so it's in this law, there are two Saturday mandated and two optional Sunday mandated. So it preserves the right for the souls to the polls of the Sunday voting. Um, so uh, so those, that's, those are some good things. That were set, you know, so that, um, but this is a suppressive law. This, this bill does make it harder to vote for certain populations and um, basically for people that maybe are working those two and three jobs. And it's just like voting isn't top of their mind all the time. The, the Republicans were very smart about seeing where some of our margins were and just chipping away at those edges and making it harder in certain times. Yeah. So um, basically, first year, uh, this uh, of the, the concern with this with Senate Bill 202, it allows the state legislature to take over county elections through the control of the state election board, and um, and to take over. You know, the Secretary of State's no longer the head of the election board. And uh, so, of course, you know, some see this as a punishment for Raffensperger. Many of us view this as uh, they they see very well we could have an executive branch of, um, of Democrats. And so basically they wanted to remove the Secretary of State from that role. So that, uh, but this is of grave concern, this potential state takeover, especially for our large counties, you know, Fulton and DeKalb. Um, and I did talk after the bill, I finally talked with a Republican, a reasonable Republican colleague of mine that I used to be a seatmate. And he was saying, well, Becky, it's just like it was with the, when, you know, for the schools, when we had the, 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 the turnover officer for the state school. And I think that's so ironic. I mean, I was like, that, but you know what, that was so unpopular. And that actually was voted down. It was a referendum that was voted down by the people of Georgia. And, and this is the most unpopular provision in this bill because all local county elections and election boards want to keep control of their elections. So uh, this is the, that's the number one thing. I, this bill dramatically decreases um, acts, uh, absentee by mail voting. So the days that you, you can, um, the amount of days that you have to request an absentee ballot have dramatically decreased. Um, and makes runoffs virtually impossible to administer by moving them to 28 days after the general election. So you may remember, I mean, the Senate race was nine weeks later, which was exceptionally long. And I think, of course, obviously it worked to our advantage. And one, and Georgia is the only state that has, uh, that we where you have to have a majority you have to have over 50% to win. So um, instead of changing that law, 
Instead, they, uh, well, excuse me, and because of that law, um, several years ago, uh, there was a ruling where we had to, in order to allow for absentee and military overseas ballots, we, we had to have this longer time for a runoff. So that's why we had the nine week runoff. So in this new bill, we will, the overseas and military will do ranked choice voting. And that's something I'm, I'm glad to see that happening. And, you know, some municipalities are doing that now as well. Um, and we can talk more about that if you have questions about that. And so they said, okay, if we do ranked choice for overseas and military, you can have a four week election. But, but most of us feel like that is still too little time because if, 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 if the loser of the election in November wants to challenge, you know, they have the right after the votes are counted to challenge, then um, literally if they, if they want, you know, want to do a recount, then you literally would do the recount, have that certified, and then it would be time for the runoff. I mean, there's like just not enough time in there. Um, yeah. And even if you don't have a recount, um, there is just going to be a week of in-person ads, early vote in, excuse me, a week of early in-person voting. And if it's over Thanksgiving, it's only two or three days. So mm -hmm. this runoff period is, is, is really a problem. And yeah, so those are the first tier. And this is according to the ACLU and I trust the ACLU. So, and then the second tier, you've heard a lot about the criminalization of things like criminalizing, giving, water to folks when they're within 150 feet of the line um but it does other things that are just you're like oh my god what are we why are we doing this like i i didn't get to take, attend the committee hearings early on because i was on other committees at that time but for the end the very end of senate bill 202 the last hearing i was able to attend and they added a provision at that where it criminalizes your battle uh you cannot if someone watches you fill out your ballot, that's like they're committing a crime. They're committing a misdemeanor. I mean, come on. It's like it's creating this police state of supervision or intimidation, you know. Um, and then the big thing, uh, there's another big thing with provisional ballots. So um, provisional ballots, you know, are, are out of precinct ballots where like, perhaps if you saw you had a big, um, uh, you know, you could go vote early vote at this one place for the, for the previous three weeks while well, election day you might go there to vote well you can't do that you have to go to your local precinct and um how current law works is that your vote if you go ahead and vote there they let you fill out a provisional ballot and your votes count for any of the race or any statewide races but your votes wouldn't count for your local right like if you for a state rep maybe you know you might be at a precinct or whatever so um but in this new law, provisional ballots um, are not counted until five o'clock. If you go to the wrong precinct between five and seven, you can fill out a provisional ballot. But then there's, you know, a very strenuous review of that too. But um, and Representative B. Wynn, who was um, uh, head of like, he basically was our the Democratic Party person looking over all this stuff, and she was really active in uh, in the Atlanta area. But she had this. There was this one polling precinct in Fulton, where out of six hundred votes cast on election day, three hundred were provisional. So this is really ineffective. Unfortunately, this is one of the way. Like, and there were ten thousand people that voted provisionally in the Senate race. So, so, and these are basically people maybe that aren't, you know. They have a lot of other stuff going on going on in their lives mm -hmm. and they might just not you know so so these people will be disenfranchised i mean you know what they say is they can go to the real precinct and that's true but if you are working through three jobs maybe you want time to go to that precinct or something so yeah. that's a big that's that's a big problem and then um and then the the, the last key big point i'd make is uh, this the Senate Bill 202 will create county budget shortfalls through cuts and unfunded mandates. So it's going to overwhelm these county budgets. Like um, uh, they have, and uh, like they have to print paper ballots on a special uh, paper, which is like 50% more expensive. Um, they uh, 
A big thing, and this is something I was talking with the county elections board lobbyist about, a big concern, and this kind of goes back to that number one item, this, all these things are mandated for counties, but they can't, um, they have they have to count the votes through the night. Like they can't stop and go home and then come back. So, and this was mainly in the big counties where this is an issue. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think, I mean, you know, knowing about it, you can plan and you can plan for a second shift to come in, but it is a burden. It's a it's a it's a burden on counties to do that. And and also they have to certify within six days instead of ten days. So um uh, but there are some some good things in the bill that 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 the Republicans say that you should be able to do these things. One of the good things is is that counties will have to they have they can open and process absentee ballots. Uh, I think two weeks ahead of time, and that is really good news. So they can't count them, but they can prepare them, and then they run them through the machine that day. So. So they should that should go more quickly, and they did allow that to happen in the general election in Georgia. But you may remember up in Pennsylvania and some of these other states, they didn't allow them to do that, and that's one reason why the votes took so long to count. Um, and the other thing, I don't know, it's not an ACLU thing. I can't believe it. I'm just looking back. So the other big thing is drop boxes. Um, the uh, drop boxes were something new in our 2020 election. They were very effective. And, uh, you know, they we had like 38 in DeKalb County. There were in many, we had one in our local fire station. They were open 24 seven. We had camera security. Well, in this new provision, the drop boxes, you can only have one per 100,000. And so we'll have like nine, eight or nine in DeKalb County. And, um, and they have to be located inside. And the other thing is they can't, so and they and you can't drop off a ballot after that Friday before the election. And we had tens of thousands of votes that were counted that were dropped off in the 2020 election on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of the of the of the election. So that is another kind of way where I'm saying it really does suppress and marginalize, you know, our our voters who just have these super busy lives, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so there we have it. Um, so I, I guess you know, at least getting the word out about how things have changed is going to be very important. Yes, yeah. Education will be very important. Yes. So we will look. You know. You know. Right now, I mean, the the bill is being contested by. Um, you know, I think there are five lawsuits now. There were four. Now there are five. So the courts may. The courts are slow, you know, so it's it's unlikely. I mean, it's possible we might hear some decisions before the municipal elections. I don't know, but um, but um, but we will need to plan, strategize, and organize and communicate. Yes, and um, and the big thing too. I mean, then of course we have the whole voter ID, which is another huge thing. Um. So there are 200 to 300,000 Georgians that don't have a state ID or, or driver's license. So, uh, but this is something we needed to work on anyway. Even in this last election, there were high school kids who just, they, they had their high school ID and that's not good enough to vote and they didn't have their state issued ID and they hadn't gotten their driver's license yet and they had to be turned away. So um, I think you're gonna see a lot of education on and help we need to help people you know have different groups help people get their mm -hmm. their id because you know it is onerous i don't know how many of you've gotten to get your driver's license in the past few years but you know you have to have like two things that show your address and then like your yeah. birth certificate i mean it's a mm -hmm. it's a pretty uh, and they scan yeah. all the stuff too all the all the documents they scan them right the, right so they keep the images of them right so that's um uh so we'll need to work together on that so look for communication from your from me or your fellow representatives and then there are other good um, advocacy groups out there and i do want to give a shout out to our uh, local media i think the atlanta journal constitution's been doing an excellent job of covering politics i mean i like listening and reading them they help me learn things that i maybe didn't know and I'm also a big fan of our public radio and television uh, station, WABE and GPD. So um, 
so I'll just put in a plug. If you don't subscribe to those organizations, I encourage you to do that because the free press is really critical to our democracy. And uh, yeah. Okay. So any questions about the voting bill before I go on? Or here, I see it in the chat now. I've been going on. Yeah, I mean, we. Yeah, I do kind of want to keep it moving because we've got okay. about twenty minutes left to cover the. Oh, okay. Okay. Items. Someone. Someone has to. I know that's a good point, Frank. That someone has. Yes, you have to. Uh, you have to have more of an ID to vote than you do to buy a gun. Isn't that crazy? So. Um, and they're publishing the voting law changes. Um, uh, they're on, they'll be on, they're on our, um, well, that's, that's a good point. Let's see, where are they? I mean, of course, the law is in the Georgia legislature. Um, and, oh, good. Okay, Frank is saying you did have to have your driver's license and your carry license. You know, last time you bought a gun, I'm not sure that you're, you don't have to have, a carry license to buy a gun though, right? I'm almost positive about that. But, um, okay, let's see. Um, how are they gonna publish the voting law changes? I mean, it's been you know, in the news quite a bit. And um, as far as the websites where you can say, these are the voting, you know, this is election law, um, I'm, you know, I would say, I mean, I go to ACLU and Fair Fight, but that's, uh, and then I go, you know, just, you can look on the Georgia legislature, but um, I would say those are the places I would go to, uh, I would go, I would go to see the actual full voting law, but you can go to georgialegis.gov and see the, see the bill and the 98H bill. And, um, and also the AJC has a good bill tracker. You can pull it up that way too. Okay. okay. And thank you out there, Frank, about that you have to call the FBI with your they they call the FBI with your social security number for the gun thing. Thank All you. right. I want to switch over to the redistricting so that we okay. can Okay, good, 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 good. To get covered with okay. everything. Yes. So every 10 years we redistrict. Um and to make sure that you have fair representational uh, uh fair representation. And so, as you know, we had our census, the 2020 census, where everyone lived, you know, I think on April 20th of 2020. Is that right? It was one day in April. And um, and because of COVID, census was delayed. And usually the census numbers come out in April and um, the final census numbers. And this year, the final census numbers will not come out till the end of September. Um, but we do have, we did have a release this past week of the initial numbers, and you may have read or heard in the news that um, Georgia will keep the same number of congressional districts. Um, we did not, we grew by about a million in population, but um, we did get a new, new seat the last census, and North Carolina didn't, and basically North Carolina got a new congressional seat this time. And uh, Florida got one, Texas got two, um, Oregon, Utah got one. But anyway, so that's based on the census. So for redistricting, um, the Georgia legislature uh, has control of drawing these new maps for redistricting. And so in some states you have independent redistricting, but in Georgia it is the, the House of Representatives starts and then the House and Senate, and then the governor will sign. So we do have a Republican trifecta, so they will have the control to draw these districts. And the Supreme Court has ruled that um, uh, partisan, uh, that you can, you can draw maps according to partisanship. You cannot draw maps according to race. Um, so, uh, and, Race is a is a is a key thing that you look at to make sure that that different races have you know adequate representation. But um, uh, but anyhow, so it's going to be very important for 
the public to be as involved as possible. And I was telling Scott earlier that um, in the Georgia House Democratic Caucus, our leadership has that we've had five different, we're gonna have five different redistricting um, conversations to learn a lot about it, all about it. And I would really recommend for those of you interested, a, a, a political science professor, Charles Bullock at University of Georgia has written a great book about redistricting and we opened with that. And it was so informative. Um, and uh, we, I will say both parties have been very partisan when they've had control of the House. And when you look at the last map, the maps that that we drew in 2000, uh, when, when, when there was Governor Barnes and we were, Democrats were trying to retain control, uh, we drew some really crazy districts and we had, um, uh, what do they call it? At large districts, which were declared unconstitutional, where we had elected three people in a bigger area, kind of like the size of a Senate area, but you didn't really know all three people represented all the districts. So, um, so uh, we will we will see what happens with this. But as you as you may well know, the rural areas have lost population, and the metro and suburban areas have greatly gained in population, and um, so, uh, we are going to do our best to talk with our folks and we want to talk a lot about, um, communities of interest, that this is the, this is the best way to draw maps that really re represent the communities. Um, and, uh, and, but the, but, but the, the only thing that the law requires is that there's equal representation, that it's purported like every district is basically, you know, equal in population. That's, mm -hmm. that's the one person, one vote. Thing. So um, uh, the chair of reapportionment is a woman named Bonnie, Bonnie uh, Rich, Representative Bonnie Rich. Um, she's up from the, in the Swanee area. And she told a colleague of mine that there would be 12 public meetings starting in June, um, but I haven't seen anything written about that. And that is from the, that is from the legislature. But there's a really wonderful group called Fair Districts, and I want to encourage you all, excuse me, to look into that. And they are um, an independent advocacy group, nonpartisan advocacy group that really is going to press us to uh, be transparent and accountable about how we're drawing our maps and having lots of public meeting and input. And so that's a, they're doing several town halls. So that's something I would just encourage you all to get involved with. And then um, I'm still waiting to hear what we're going to do as a caucus. But I think based on this, what we're doing, that we'll you know have some tools, some assessment tools to go out into our communities and um, and get some feel on what fair districts would look like. And the software now has really gotten quite, uh, it's it's excellent. And so they we can all submit maps. We can submit our own maps. I mean, of course we're not gonna send, I mean, I'm not gonna necessarily do it on my own. I'm gonna work with a lot of other people, but you know, you can suggest maps for different districts. So, okay. Okay. Um, let me move on uh, and we'll pick up the questions later. Okay. Um, but let me move on here so that we can uh, try to get through the five items by eight o'clock. Okay. Um, so uh, for HB 134 and HB 156, uh, I, I'm going to bring these up just quickly, but these are bills that seek to exclude certain cybersecurity information from open records requirements. Um, and in general, yes, you don't want uh, an attacker to be able to um, make an open records request to find out exactly how to attack the state networks. But at some point, uh, you might want to, you know, I, th there is a public interest in finding out if the state did have a breach at some point in time and, and is the state doing what the state needs to do um, to be able to protect itself. Um, and I mean, there is a certain public interest. There's a uh, interest for reporters and, and just general citizens. And so it's hard to find the right balance there. Um, and that can be difficult. Uh, now, Andy, I noticed that you're typing. If you want to jump in and, and, and say something about this, because I know you've taken a look at these bills, then feel free to turn on your camera and your microphone if you want to 
jump in on this a little bit. But uh, so what I, I I haven't looked at the status of these. I think one of them made it all the way through to the governor's desk. I'm not sure if the other one did, but you know I don't see any point in in trying to ask for a veto on these that that that, that we should look at maybe a fixed bill in the next session. So one of the bills has already been signed. I post a link to a blog okay. post that I wrote earlier today. One of the bills has already been signed into law, okay. uh, and uh, the other one has not been. And uh, in, in my write-up on my blog post, I, I straight up asked Governor Kemp to veto uh, the bill that's sitting on his desk right now. Um, the the 134 bill, let me bounce over here and make sure I'm talking about the right bill at the right time. Um, but the, 130, the 134 bill, is the bill that carves out uh, just a, a massive hole uh, that will basically allow uh, any governmental entity to hide uh, from any public discussion all about anything cybersecurity related with the way the language is currently written. Um, and, and Scott, you made the point that you've got to strike a, a proper balance between protecting your operational concerns, which are legitimate, versus public oversight and citizen overview. Uh, in, in my read of this bill, uh, they've swung simply way too far in the, uh, in the direction of, we're not gonna talk about anything. And uh, we've already seen governmental entities like the city of Atlanta and others uh, hide behind uh, existing language uh, that's already on, on the books in terms of law to claim that they're not going to talk about uh, things like the city of Atlanta ransomware attack uh, as well as the recent uh, solar winds breach and, and just trying to find out city of Atlanta won't even talk about whether or not they use solar winds much less whether they use the infected version of solar winds that, that was out there and uh, and I worked with Richard Belcher at WSB on this and they just stonewalled it and uh, asked him yeah asked him to reach out to to other entities Gwinnett County uh, I think he reached out to DeKalb they were a bit more forthcoming but overall, there's a sense that, in general, we're not going to talk about anything cyber, and the public doesn't need to know it. We're going to hide behind the language of, well, we're protecting our operational interests, and we can't let the bad guys know what we're doing. Um, and in, that, in the abstract, I agree with that concept, but you've got to find the proper balance. And this, this bill is currently written and sitting on Governor Kemp's desk. I, I don't think does it at all. So, so is, one, is 134 um, the one that has not been signed yet? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, one thing I was talking with Scott about, that, um, uh, I mean, I do think it's good to know that you, you know, you asked him for the veto. That's, that's, that's helpful information. Um, and then what I said to Scott is, is that if you all want to suggest alternate language there, and that line's 49 through 54, you know, um, uh, if you, you know, or, or or say that would be good. Or and if and if you don't have alternate language, just saying your specific issues, and I would be happy to bring an amendment. Or you know, I'd be happy to talk to the sponsor of the bill, who was a new legislator, and he seems like a reasonable guy to me, uh, Victor Anderson. So we can, but we can certainly, you know, try to address this this issue if you want in next session and if it's not you know if it would have more success if it would be good to request a meeting with him i would i would suggest maybe you all ask to meet with him and uh and with your ideas about how it can be improved um and then uh if he says i'm not going to do it then that's okay but you never know Right. So, and that for that reason, I'm, I'm hoping that, that the governor will, will veto it as it currently sits and ask the, the, the General Assembly for a, for a more tailored version of this bill that, that he could sign off on. Because again, the, the concerns are legitimate. They've just swung way too far with, with that language. Right. Um, 156 uh, it has already been signed into law. And yeah. what, we're seeing, what we're seeing here is the theme of we're not going to talk about cybersecurity incidents at all. Um, 
And so uh, 156 creates uh, a couple of new code sections. And uh, the second code section that they created is fine, um, where it just gives the governor the authority to make a determination about a memorandum of, of agreement. You know, that language is fine. Uh, and that's section 38-3-23.2 uh, for you legislative gearheads, I guess, like I'm becoming slowly but surely. Um, the follow -up, which one? Which portion? Uh, it is. Uh, so are you looking at the bill itself? I have a, bill, right? I have a printed version of the bill right now. Okay. Yeah. So uh, page four, lines 72 yeah. through yeah, yeah, 78. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. language is fine. That makes sense. That's no problem. Um, looking at page three, uh, everything in uh, going from page two, starting at line 18, where they, where they uh, create section 38-3-22.2, uh, everything from line 18 down to 65 is okay. That language requires entities, governmental entities, and utilities to report to home, uh, state homeland security uh, when they suffer a, uh, an incident. And that's reasonable, and that language follows closely with what's happening at the national level. And if I recall correctly, they even say that if you report to the national level, you've met your due diligence uh, for the state in terms of reporting for awareness purposes. The problematic section is lines 66 and 67 on page three where once again, they just carve out a wholesale exemption saying none of the reporting that you get under this, uh, under this code uh, is, is gonna be subject to public inspection or disclosure. Um, now, I, I heard uh, an interview with another, uh, I did something with, uh, with, I think it was Belcher on this one or, or somebody else, I don't remember who it was, but um, the, the senator who was, one of the senators who was sponsoring the bill I said, well, we don't want the bad guys to know what we're doing. And uh, it's a great argument. It plays well on TV, but it's nonsense. And the reason why it's nonsense is that the bad guys are already in your network at this point in time. The reports that you were getting as a result of, uh, of, of the requirements here and the, the mandating for the reporting are after the fact. And so uh, any, any documentation or reporting uh, that you get uh, exposed to this uh, is uh, is uh, the proverbial horse has already left the barn, and um, and so if they're, if they're really concerned about keeping the stuff close hold, fine, uh, carve out an exemption that says we're going to hold this the, these particular class of records for thirty days, forty five days, right? If you're concerned that the incident is still ongoing and you don't want to you don't want to turn the documentation loose. Um, okay, that's fine. Theoretically, I can understand the argument, but you 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 put a timeline on it. You put you put uh, you put an end of life on it and say after this point in time, these records are no longer exempt from public examination, um, and and you go on from there. Uh, Frank made a comment here uh, that uh, they can make every meeting about cybersecurity and then. Uh, absolutely bypass any public disclosure and that ref that's going back to the previous one yeah uh, you can talk exactly. about you it's can talk about loophole. 30 seconds and and then yeah you, it's it's, it's, it's a loophole the size of a, of a mac truck so um that's well, that's what i've got well i appreciate, I appreciate andy thank you so much and um and you know scott had brought this to my attention i'm really glad to be listening to you all and um if you so i guess i would say if it has passed then maybe what the same type thing is that if you have if you want to work with me to you know create language to or i mean i know this guy too i mean uh don parsons is a i mean we could ask the bill sponsor if he'd be willing to take an amendment on um and like I said, all I can do is say no. And if he says no, then I can submit it. We can get it on the record. But it's, it's more effective to go to the bill sponsor um, and ask them for their consideration and and let them hear directly from you. So if you if you'd be interested in me facilitating in any of those conversations with those two bill sponsors, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to help where I can. 
Okay. Well, let's. I'll. I'll try to keep this moving, and and let's let's have some more conversations over the summer, and we may have an opportunity before before one of them gets signed too. So I'll try to keep this moving in the background. Um, Andy, I want to thank you for that, um, but I do want to move on to our last two topics here um, to wrap it up pretty soon. I'm going to um, step away. You'll have a good evening, Representative Evans. Thanks for your time. Good. I appreciate thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. You thank too. You, so much. you too. Yeah, thank Everybody you. stay healthy. Um, I wanted to move on to the topic of rural broadband and just spend a few minutes on that. Uh, it's something that we want to support to the extent that it's, you know, that we can do that in a meaningful way. Um, but, you know, I live in a pretty urban area and your district is fairly urban. So um, I'm, I'm still kind of playing catch up on that. But yeah. I do think it's something that would benefit the entire state and it would help balance things out between rural and urban areas if we if we have a way to, to kind of equalize, um, you know, or make it proportional um, to get, you know, better service out to the rural areas so that we're not, you know, putting people on DSL speed or we're not asking them to drive down to a coffee shop or something like that. Right. Well, this is a huge priority for, for Georgia. Um, and, uh, and there, there's been broad support, um, in the legislature to support rural broadband. Um, uh, and it is getting expanded quite a bit. I, I forgot to look up the numbers um, and I, um, I regret I don't have that handy. I apologize for that um, for, for this session, but uh, I do know also in the CARES Act, a lot of uh, money is being used for rural broadband and for the CARES Act. So this is an issue for our schools, you know, for the education and workforce development, and it's an issue for like the companies. You know, if you want to, you need to have good access to broadband um, in order to have jobs. Um, so um, this, you know, this. Since I've been in the legislature, the state has, you know, they've created ways for like, you know, the 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 co-ops to provide. Bar they've tried to create more avenues for 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 broadband, um, but uh, this is like the first budget where we've been at, we're at, you know, we're actually allocating funds to rural broadband. So um, I would just say we share that, you know, we agree with you. This is a huge national priority for the federal government as well. Wow. Um, so um, I'm hopeful about it, but I probably need to do a little more homework myself to give your report back on. Uh, I, I, I was not able to, to gather all my data together yeah. about what the status is right now. Um, I, I will say there is still a need, you know, in in a, in our area. Like for example, in in our district down there by Georgia State at Panthersville and the GBI building, there are neighborhoods down there that only have one provider, and it's and they and they, it's very slow, mm -hmm. like they don't have. You know, we're so lucky around where we live. We have five G and all that kind of stuff. You know, um, and Google Fiber and all that, and um. But uh, so there are pockets in South DeKalb, and I, I imagine in parts of South Atlanta, I don't know, where there's not any competition and there's for, for good internet access and they still have very slow mm -hmm. service. Well, I heard a story from a librarian, and this was not in Georgia, but a woman came into the library because um, she didn't have internet access and she was in this situation where she couldn't afford to buy a phone because she didn't have a job. But in applying for a job, they required to send a text back to your phone um, before before you could go through this acceptance process. So they assume that you have a phone uh, and she couldn't get the phone because she didn't have a job and she couldn't get the job because she didn't have it's, a phone. Yes, so it's yes. A thing. So I think we're in a situation where we might still have a few legislators out, legislators out there who think that internet is is a luxury item. And well, I think that I think that has no. I think that has changed. I think it, it's just the issue of, um, you know, they they initially they wanted it all. They wanted it to be where they just created the avenue to make it more competitive uh, for 
different providers to come in because it's you know it's expensive and if there are not a lot of people there you have to figure out how it's going to get paid for so it's, now it's, it's yeah. becoming more and more a condition of citizenship exactly really. Yes, no, I I agree with you, and I think the legis the legislators on board. This is a bipartisan thing where there's been agreement, mm -hmm. especially this year. So, um, but uh, as far as you know, we always say the budget is a reflection of your of your priorities and morals. So I'm not sure how big a proportion, but I do know this year for the first time we did really give some good funding to it. Um, yes, and you're right, Frank. It's just like rural electrification. In the, in the yeah, and I, I wonder if we will move toward universal service at some point. That is, that would be fabulous, wouldn't it? Yes. Um, yes, and what was the last thing we wanted to talk about? Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up quickly uh, was the pro police surveillance tech reform. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of... Um, public concern about how policing is done these days and the goal of this is not to come down on the police but to maybe come down on the vendors because there's a lot of vendors out there that are selling solutions and some of them may be just fine but then some of them may violate our right which are not just give me a minute here some of them are not um really we're not really getting our money's worth and an example of the latter case there was a system in Utah, it was sold to Utah for $20 million. It was an artificial intelligence surveillance system and they had to do a security review on it. And as a result of the security review, they determined that the system had no artificial intelligence in it whatsoever. And so, oh they, spent, yes, so they spent $20 million in Utah on a system and they basically got flummoxed by this vendor. So oh. we feel like that's going on over and over again, that it's 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 just a little bit too easy to sell junk to to um, maybe some elements of law enforcement or maybe the, um, you know, city councils or, or um, county county boards or whatever. There needs to be more review. So um, there's a movement to try to get more review into this process, and it's called CCOPS. It's uh, community, uh, what is it? Community um, control over police surveillance, or or something like that. And um, so, you know, it, it's it's a um, an attempt to get some more review into this process. You want to look at are our rights really being protected? Because it's not incumbent on the vendor to do that. It's incumbent on the government. But also, is the state getting its money money's worth? Um, well, I, and, I'm yeah. I'm so glad to learn about that. And um, I will say Georgia is priding itself. We have the we have the Cyber Security Center in Augusta. Are mm -hmm. you all familiar with that? Oh yes. And and so um, you know, I know they want to think that they would never get uh, they would never get had like I guess Utah did. Mm -hmm. But, um, but uh, I think this is good. So I um, on this AI intelligence. What do you think? How? What? It, what kind of role would you see the legislature have? Like, uh, do you know if, if any? Well, I, what I think is that um, efforts around the country are starting at the city level, and so it okay. may just be a matter of of staying out the of the way initially, so that we get this done at a city level, and we have sort of a model to follow. And once you have that model to follow, you can scale it up. The problem in Metro Atlanta is we have at least seventy different districts that are city or county governments. And so yes. there's a lot of them. So maybe at some point you do want to scale it up to the state level. But what usually happens is we start at the city level and we move up from there. Right. And that's being so, done in other places like St. Louis and Portland and, right. and Berkeley and, and, and New York City. Uh, we're in touch with some of these groups that are, that are doing okay. work out there that, that's kind of similar. Good. I would, I would say, you know, we, we could look at it in the Atlanta and Decatur, but you might look at cities like Brookhaven. Brookhaven, like that would be interesting to know if you're doing anything because they are a, a city with their own police force and um, and and a good tax base. So, so uh, yeah, Brookhaven, Shambly, Doraville, see if they're because they might be some of the first to adopt some of this stuff, maybe even more. I don't know. I'm just thinking, I, don't, I really don't know that. But. 
um, I would look at more than just Atlanta and Decatur. Okay. Yeah. And I think that this is just an introductory yeah. conversation. I think this will go on. I think this may be yes. a year long process. Okay. Where we feel like we ought to be with this, but I wanted to, yeah. to bring it up. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I guess the last and final, I'll do the, the, the first Q and A or the last and final thing I wanted to talk about. Um, if you're someone who's interested in running for, um, public office somewhere, what advice would you give to them? If there's wow. somebody here in our group. Yes. Thank you for asking. Um, I would say do your research, um, uh, know your community, know where you would be running. Um, uh, if you, if you are running against an incumbent, you know, do your research on the incumbent. Um, if it's an open seat, that's a little different. Uh, reach out to community leaders. Um, you don't need endorsements from other political or elected officials. You need respected community leaders and influencers to, to, you need to gain their trust and support. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's my main thing, but do your research. There's a lot of great political training, um, that's, and, and good reading that's available. Um, and, uh, and then talk to, talk to other, if you, if you're interested, you know, you're welcome to come talk to me or talk to, uh, other elected officials just to get, you know, their feedback on things. Yeah. And it does take money to run a campaign takes money. So you mm -hmm. have to be willing to ask people for money. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But it's mainly, you know, your community leaders that will help you. And then if you have, and it takes a team, like I had a team of supporters that helped me. I mean, and I try to keep the team approach as much as I can. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I want to open it up to other questions now. You can either type your question or feel free to turn on your camera and your microphone if you'd like to, um, you know, if you'd like to jump in uh, and, and ask a question live. Um, so we'll be open to questions now uh, if you'd like to go ahead and do that. I'd like to come back because I can't see the chat <laughs> at, at all for some reason. Hmm. Um, so. First of all, could you Chuck, type uh, your chat, the chat can be minimized? And if I'm you sorry. See the, little, the chat can be minimized. If you see the little icon at the top left, looks like a head and shoulders. Yes. With an arrow. Click that. The chat uh, window can open. Uh, That's chat. not the problem. I see it. Are says you on a mobile type. phone? No, it's it's not a problem. I don't want to waste uh, uh, Representative Evans's time. Um, could you um, type in the chat? Um, your newsletter or how we can oh, follow you because I you. wanted to do that. I follow a lot of different people um, even I if I'm not in their that. district. Yeah. And also one of the things that was mentioned about broadband. Um, so what I've been learning from different people in the community is that um, I think we need to work on education about why broadband would be the best thing to do. Scott, you can help me with this because there's a lot of, it's, it's kind of a vendor issue where people talk about 5G or they talk about satellite. Um, but my understanding is that if you don't have the broadband first, that you can't actually do the other things. A am I wrong about that, Scott? Does the, did we not learn this? Like we need broadband because broadband is the base and then we need uh, when other people kind of start talking about who their favorite is, that that's fine. There may be a reason for some of that, but that's actually like another technology that's coming into play. And I feel like that's where we're getting lost in the politics because I know specifically I watched closely about the committees. So Albers was really pro satellite and 5G. He liked, he, he was talking a lot about like, oh, broadband is too expensive. We can't do broadband. Except that I think he was doing that because he liked the people that were going to be the people that were his favorites in business as, as they do. And, um, but you know, Senator Gooch on the other hand was, um, been working on this for quite a while and he seemed like that would be something that I would want to speak with him about so that he can understand when he wants to have like different, um, groups 
whether they're electrical membership cooperatives or whatever involved in this so that different business partners could make money that we want to be like promoting the broadband. We don't want to be talking about the other things. Um, at least this is what I've learned by people smarter than me. And I thought that that's something we could work on because I feel like that um, for the people in the minority party that don't often get to speak in the committee, that that's a good talking point because the broadband is uh, what we really need to be. Uh, that That is that is what um, we need to be educating people that that is the backbone that we need to have. That if you think you're going to just put 5G throughout rural Georgia, you're still going to have to have the broadband in order for the 5G to work. Am I wrong about that? Does anybody from San Francisco want to tell me I'm wrong about that? Because I believe that that's what well, I was the, learning. <laughs> the backhaul, Frank said it perfectly, the backhaul for all the 5G is broadband. Now, the difference is, <clears throat> it's different running broadband just to towers as opposed to running to every single person's home. Different scale. But if we're answering the equity question, we want we want to promote broadband. Well, broadband is irrespective of its transmission method. It could be a cable, it could be wireless, it doesn't really matter. It just has to be ubiquitous and it actually has to be fast enough. That's one of the other problems with wireless is density. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Frank just posted it. Yes, there's the issue of uh, cost density and also, uh, for instance, to get blanket 5G coverage of every rural area, you don't have the population base to warrant the, the tower structure for the limited radiation footprint of 5G. Whereas in a case like that, satellite would work better. Um, where Starlink is a very good example of broadband. It's not online yet. Everything I've been following on it looks really good. The downside is you've got a monopoly that most people can't compete with. And so where that leads in the long run, we don't know. We also don't know about backhaul yet on, on them. It look, In theory, it looks good. Everything they've said, so far is proven to be what they said it would be, but it isn't done yet. So we'll see. Um, but the issue of broadband is very, very important. I mean, uh, I'm, I work at Georgia Tech and we got literally three days notice that everybody was going home. Now, mind you, I already worked full time from home, but everybody had to go home. Now we transition that very, very rapidly and very, very well. But if you talk to the people out near Augusta or Lake Oconee, they don't even have dial up. And, uh, or uh, I remember we had a contractor, this is a long time ago, but we had a contractor who lived up in uh, Smoke Rise, or not Smoke Rise, up by uh, uh, Mount Helena, uh, uh, Helena, Georgia, and up in that area. And he didn't have, um, he could only get a party line. You can't have a modem on a party line. Mm -hmm. So they had no connectivity at all. <clears throat> so uh, that's better. In fact, they get better connectivity there now than I get. I live in Tucker. Or near Tucker. In fact, there's a street, a block off Main Street Tucker, that can get no broadband whatsoever from any carrier. So, and that's not rural. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a serious problem. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yes. No, I I hear you, and um, I'm not. Yeah, I I don't. I absolutely agree that it's a huge economic issue, and I and it's 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 economic, and as and of course it was even driven how more it was an educational issue, which is of course becomes an economic issue. So I'm not at all downplaying. I, I will say it's just something I'm not as uh, up to speed on, but I um, but I do uh, agree with you that this is a huge issue. So I would, and it sounds like many of you are or Chuck at least was monitoring the committee meeting. So what would be good, one of the things I, I try to do is I have a, uh, you know, subject matter experts I turn to, um, like I have an education person and a healthcare person. So maybe I want y'all to be my, my, uh, my, like, I don't know what do you call it, electronic frontier or, <laughs> I don't know, or, 
digital person or whatever, and then you can help me when these broadband bills are coming up. I can make sure if we need to amplify certain viewpoints, I, I can, we can do that, you know. Oh, I'm definitely I'm glad to help you. I am not the subject matter expert, but I know them, oh. and I am very good at <laughs> right. and I running back and forth. Of, I imagine most of them do, you know, that I'm, I'm sure that the people sponsoring these bills are talking, you know, to, to good people too. But you want to, you know, we can make sure that whatever this group is concerned about, that that your perspective is being heard. You know, we can make sure of that at least. Yeah. Yes. We're interested in the equity question so that all people in Georgia can have access. And that is wonderful. And I'm very interested in that. And I'd say, you know, really, and I know, of course, the Democratic caucus is, and I think our Republican colleagues, too, I mean, they, everyone's favorite line is how to get a great education regardless of zip code. That's the, you know, what we all say. And and I think most of us really believe that. And so um, we're interested in the equity question, too. So, good. Yeah, the, there's the other political factor. There's a lot of people who own a piece of that political pie. There's the incumbents who don't want necessarily things to change. Um, there, there's competition issues. There's all kinds of things. Google stopped putting out their fiber because every time they wanted to run fiber to a neighborhood, the incumbents fought them tooth and nail um, to get them blocked legislatively so they weren't allowed to do it. That's why you're seeing uh, areas come out now and say that they're opening to uh, community broadband, which is essentially saying, okay, thumbs up at the, the uh, incumbents, we're gonna allow the community to build their own broadband. And in mm -hmm. most cases where the community is kind of like a co-op, has built their own broadband, they get better and faster service than the current incumbents. And I'm talking Comcast, AT&T incumbents. You're talking about the incumbents, not politicians, you're talking about Comcast and AT&T, is that right? Yeah. Oh yeah, and they have, they have yeah. millions of okay. dollars to lobby and everything else. It gets very, very hairy. They can, teams of lawyers can write all kinds of stuff and send it yeah. in. Yeah, okay. Court. And so they've used the courts to block access yeah. to the right of ways and everything else. It's 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 getting access to the po the telephone poles so that you can run yeah. lines easily. So they restricted that or made it so that you, that they had to work through a lot of paperwork to get access to these polls okay interesting yeah and, and not just one poll they would make every single poll on the route a separate work order scheduled separately like just like painstaking teeth pulling slow <laughs> process oh, like every nail move was a separate <laughs> yeah. work order Wow. Well, that's interesting because I, I know, you know, I live here in Bird Hills and Georgia Power uh, for the Kirkwood grid wanted to, um, wanted to bury our power lines, which we were delighted about because we have tall trees that take out our power all the time. But, um, and then in the, but then we were sad because they said they're not going to take down the poles because the other carriers have, their lines on the poles, like, you know, ATT and Comcast. And it was, and also it would just take them more time to get the agreement for all of them to be together in the same, in the same, you know, cable or tube or whatever in the ground. And um, so I hadn't, I guess I hadn't paid, I really hadn't paid as much attention to all this stuff. I would say, but I mean, I knew it was going on, like ACCG, probably the county people are probably good. Lob lobbyists for well i don't know were they i mean how were they on this issue did they i think the main thing is local governments want to also be able to they want to it's protect it's their abilities to do so. what so, uh, representative uh, yeah. evans to my direct knowledge um i know comcast for instance in the johns creek alpharetta area 
did a technical uh, upgrade called splitting a node just simply to keep up with capacity, but they thought nothing of rolling internet blackouts for multiple days at a time while they did this because I guess presumably people don't work from home, so you can cut their internet in the middle of the day and there's no big deal. Um, huge wow. deal, of course. Yes. I mean, but um, I am secondhand aware from talking with people in city government aware with a matter that at one time there was a case where there was like good Wi-Fi in, in Alpharetta. Um, there was a volunteer who put it together and, and I don't want to overspeak my knowledge, but it is no longer there. And my understanding was, is that was seen as unfair governmental competition with the private provider and therefore improper, but there's no provider providing the equivalent of high quality uh, Wi-Fi in the entire city center of Alpharetta. So it's just simply no longer a service there. So hmm. some of that happens. I think it's a lot of, I mean, it's obviously a lot of business deals that are being done. And so a lot of these deals in Georgia get done by who curries favor with whom and, yeah. and and yeah. that type of thing. I know in the uh, the bills that um, Andy spoke about that uh, Georgia Municipal Association and the Advancing Georgia Counties were involved in that, and they spoke very favorably, and that's how it just slid right through. I also thought, I mean, you probably were there on the ground. I couldn't go this year uh, because of the uh, pandemic, but I assume that a lot of this got uh, kind of slid through and greased uh, as it as it were, because everybody was already fighting about uh, 202 and and or what it became, and that there was no chance um, at some point if you didn't want to have just a complete fight that you had to just go along and agree with things because that's the way the votes looked when I looked at the record to see like who voted yay and who voted nay type uh -huh. of thing because that happens. I don't know. That's what I thought was happening. I because yeah. th there was no way that you could object easily. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, so I'm not on those committees, so I didn't, I'm not as intimately involved. And certainly these lobbyists are not coming to me. I mean, I'm like, you know, a member of the minority party, not on the committee. And so I don't, I don't even really know the, you know, the, and, uh, but I think, yeah, the, I mean, a lot of deals still got done. The, the corporate lobbyists were at the legislature. They were definitely there at this time. Maybe this, the advocacy groups, the people weren't there as much, but yeah. Somehow right. it's easier for yeah. those people to get there than those of us who are riding Somehow. the subway. <laughs> Somehow. Why is that? Okay. Well, good. Well, um, I, I do need to go, but is there any last wrap up or any last anything or um, before we head off? Or? Well, thank you for coming. I really, I really appreciate it. Good. I'm so glad to meet you all. And uh, and, and Scott, thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, and I want and, to say, and, and I want to say, uh, just uh, echo my appreciation um, for coming in tonight and and uh, sharing with us. And I think, you know, I think that that one of the roles that I play is just to try to get people talking to each other. So, yeah, uh, you know, I hope, you know, I hope that that that. Uh, that alone, you know, kind of makes makes a better world. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, one of the things that I'm every year I try to get, do a little more as far as being proactive. Um, so uh, uh, I'm, you know, for a legislative agenda of my own. So if there are things that you want me to advocate for, um, you know, Scott, maybe you could uh, help me help me with that. So uh, we, you could be a conduit for that. Okay. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for your good work. And uh, uh, let me know if I can be helpful. And I hope you'll get my sign from my websites. And um, I mean, sign up for my newsletters. And I put my social media stuff in there, too. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thank you very good. much. Thank you.